Here with 12 Chavarim, I'm Stephen Benun, and you're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. We'll be catching up with Israeli news tomorrow, tomorrow evening, Israeli News Live, that is. Uh, right now, things are a little bit on the quiet side. It makes you a little bit nervous when it gets like that there. It looked pretty much like it was going to go into an all-out war with the way Hezbollah attacked Israel, but it's settled down for the moment. So we'll be watching and keeping you up to date on that as, as, as details develop about that in the north part of Israel. So at, at this point here, though, I want to take you over to Exodus chapter 3. And I want to take, I'm going to start with you in Hebrew, uh, the, the Hebrew version of the Bible here. It's Gimel in, in the uh, Hebraic text Shemot, the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. It says here, Ve'yomer Moshe el ha'elahim, and Moses says to God, Behold, uh, if I go unto the children of Israel, and say to them, uh, The Lord, uh, the God of thy fathers, has sent me unto you. They will say to me, What is his name? Mashemo. Mamel Elohim. What do I say to them? The Yomer Elohim El Moshe, and God says to Moses, Ihaye Asha Ihaye, the Yomer Kota Amar Livne Israel, Ihaye Shelachani Eliachem. And the Lord said to Moses, I am, or I will be that which I am. This is what you will say to them, to the children of Israel. I am has sent me unto you. Now, I've mentioned this to you guys many times in the past, and some of those I know we have a lot of new listeners right now, a couple of thousand, in fact, in just in the last couple of weeks alone. And some of the new listeners may not realize that these passages are passages that have never been fulfilled. Moses says to God, they will ask me, what is your name? But yet we have nothing recorded in the book of Exodus or in the Torah where Israel ever asked Moses, what is God's name? Of course, God doesn't even answer with his name. He says to him, Ihaye Asha Ihaye, which Ihaye happens to be a derivative of the name uh, Yahweh, as it's called by many people, Yahweh. Uh, but we're not really sure of that pronunciation either. We know Yahweh is not right. We know that uh, well, several other the ideas are not correct. Um, but the point is, the children of Israel in this day here will definitely want to know what the divine name of God is. Because amongst the Jewish people, more than anyone, knowing the sacred name of God and how to pronounce it after it being lost in the... In the in, in, in time after the destruction of the second temple, his pronunciation of his name was lost because the Christians were literally burning the Jewish rabbis at the stake for pronouncing this name. Such a sacred name. In fact, I can't wait till we bring out more information on this Antichrist spirit. And, and let me just say this, because what I'm going to go into tonight is judgment. The way God is going to judge things in the very near future. And I felt like this is a message that's very pertinent right now. But let me share with you in, in, in saying that. So many people have made comments that it's a Muslim Mahdi, it's a Muslim Antichrist. No, you're wrong on this. It's not the Vatican. Or, you know, you pontificate the scriptures, in fact, and, and what you're saying there. And yet, many of the people that are saying this have never seen all the videos that we've done on this, clearly making the case. God himself makes the case of who destroyed the temple, who destroyed the sanctuary, who is going to be in the end game, and it's going to be Rome, clear and simple as that. And something we have discovered recently about the ten kingdoms is going to blow you out flat. And when you find out who's really behind it, who's putting it together, even a book that I have, on the, I have the actual manual for a, up to a 33rd degree mason, what they are taught. The Catholic Church, you think, is the root of it. Well, oddly enough, they take it all the way back to Egypt. 
which is where the Vatican gets its roots at in the first place. And it's taught even all the way up to the 33rd degree level Mason. I have the entire manual and it states in there, when you have this particular book, if you do not return it, it is written in plain black and white that they will kill you if you don't return it. Well, I never borrowed it in the first place. It came into my hands miraculously. So I have learned a lot from there and learned exactly what the agenda is. It is to unite all the religions of the world, bringing the commonality of them together. We're going to be going into some of that. But I want to go into these things tonight, these unfulfilled promises about Moses, because, of course, a lot of people debate with me, too, who the two witnesses are. Clearly, it's Moses and Elijah. We know this because Yeshua says, when they ask him the question, doesn't the scripture say that, uh, that Elias, which is the Greek word for Elijah, isn't he supposed to first come and restore all things? Well, Yeshua clearly put it in the future. He said, yes, he must first come and he will restore all things. Now, John the Baptist is already dead, mind you, so therefore John the Baptist is definitely not the Elijah that comes and restores all things. And clearly, all things have not been restored as of yet. I know that there are some that have written me that believe that that is so. But the restoration of all things includes Israel being a nation recognized by God. Now, not the political spectrum that we see now. We know that much of the politics of Israel is in the hand of Rome. Much of these politicians that go and bow to the Pope of Rome are actually controlled by the Vatican. In fact, if you think about it, even Russia threatening the United States, this is all nothing but one big puppeteer program growing on. Did we forget that Vladimir Putin was at the Vatican only, what, eight months before all of this, kissing the ring of the Pope, bowing down, and including the Russian Orthodox equivalent to the Pope, has gone and bowed to the Pope as well and reunited themselves again together. Wait till you see some of the things that we've discovered in modern times. Quotations, things, the agenda that the Vatican has publicly stated. It's going to swim your head backwards to see it. Nonetheless, going back to the scripture here in, in Exodus chapter 3, Moses says to God, they're going to ask me, what is your name? Now, God does, Moses does tell the children of Israel what God's name is when God comes to Moses later and says they, that Abraham did not know me by this name here. At the time, we, I call it Yahweh. But that's still not the correct pronunciation. It has been lost in time. And it is a, God's sacred name. But yet, it is a name that is made up of three verbs. I am, I will be, and I will be forever. Is basically what his name is made up of. So, so the question is asked. Ma Shimon, what is, they will ask me, what is your name? They will say to me. And he says, uh, Moses says to God, See, I say to them, actually, uh, I say to them, I will say to them that the God of their fathers has sent me unto them. Amuli, they will say to me, Ma Shemo. And we do not have a biblical evidence where they said to Moses when he comes to them, What is his name? but they will this time around. Interesting, isn't it? Now, going over to Exodus 15, now this is something that Rashi, the great Torah commentator from a uh, thousand years ago, actually wrote uh, himself. He brought this one out here in Exodus 15, the song of Moses after the Red Sea crossing. Uh, Moses says here, Az Yashia Moshe uvene Yisrael et ha hazot excuse me, la ya, let's just say to the Lord, unto the Lord. Um, and he said, then saying Moses, this song uh, and the children of Israel, uh, unto the Lord. Ve'yomer, excuse me, ve'yomru, and they and, and they said, le'mod, saying, ashira. 
כי גאה גאו, סוס ורק יבוא רמה ביום. I will sing unto the Lord. See? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. Those of you that know me, I've taught many, many times. As Rashi points out, it is in the future. This clearly is a future event, and the consensus of the sages was that Moses undoubtedly is coming back. Now, the Rashi's actually even quoting the sages back before uh, his time, all the way back to the time uh, before Yeshua came, some of the writings that they have back then. That it is a future song, and it must be during the Mishiach, uh, uh, Mashiach age, the, the, the age of the Messiah, that Moses will return and he will sing this song. A lot of different conjectures that they have on that. Clearly, though, to me, what it is, is that Moses returns to do what? To deal with the Antichrist, the horse and his rider that we find in Revelation, because Moses clearly sings that he will sing unto the Lord that they have gotten victory, victory over the horse and his rider. Now, looking, looking forward a little bit into this, uh, I'm going to share some other scriptures with you, but let me take you to, uh, before I go to Exodus 34, remember when Moses and the children of Israel, right after they crossed the Red Sea, about three and a half, four months later, or something like that, they're moving from the wilderness of sin to Rephidim. And though the children of Israel have seen all these great miracles, they still are doubting God's covenant that He makes with His people. They still can't believe. They get to Rephidim, and Moses commands them to set up camp there, and there's no water there. And the people are thirsting to death. Moses says, he goes to the Lord in prayer and he says, Lord, they're almost ready to stone me. It's kind of ironic that he says that as well because the two witnesses, it appears that that's exactly what's going to happen to them at the end of their three and a half years ministry. They're going to be stoned to death right there near the Palestinian bus station outside of the Damascus gate. Moses said, they're almost ready to stone me. And let me, just, let me just share that with you. I actually cut that one out and pasted it because I have so many different things open here. The people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? This is Exodus 17, verse 2. Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses. And said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and, 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 uh, and, and our children and our cattle with thirst? Do you know, Moses was a perfect type of Christ right here. The rock itself that he's going to smite is the representation of Christ in the first place. The Hatsua, the, the rock that is going to be smitten. And Moses cries unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? They, they're almost ready to stone me. Verse 4. And, and the Lord said, in verse 5, unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel. By the way, Aaron was included in that. Do you know that Aaron, along with the elders, were part of those chiding against Moses? which is very much the same thing that happened 2,000 years ago when Yeshua was here. What did the elders of Israel do? They chided with Jesus. They actually wanted to stone him just like they wanted to stone Moses. They said to Jesus, you make yourself God, saying that you're the Son of God. They wanted to stone him. They wanted to stone him because he healed someone on the Sabbath. So he says, God says to him, take the elders of Israel, go out. And thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, and take it in thy hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before, before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, what's interesting, this is exactly what God did. when Christ was on the cross. The elders of Israel judged him. 
They chided with him. God brought them out. They smit, they smote him. They delivered him up to the Romans to be killed. And when his side was thrust through, out came water from his side as well. He'd already shed his blood. But out of his side came water, just like when Moses smote the rock. You know, the odd thing is, though, had Israel not drank this water, even those that condemned him, they would have died. In fact, even in the trusting, in the deliverance of what Christ did 2,000 years ago when he gave his life for Israel and for the world, when we do not trust in him, we lose. In fact, the odd thing is, it's very interesting, is when you get to Let's, let's go ahead and read, though, because God brings that water out. And the people that they may drink, and Moses did so in the sight of all the elders of Israel. Verse 7 says, And he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah, because the children of the, the, excuse me, the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Can you believe that? That's what was happening 2,000 years ago. Yeshua said, I'm the Son of God. They said, you make yourself God. And then the, the, the other part of the children of Israel, they would see the miracles and they would say, truly, how could this man do it unless he come from God? And so there was a huge argument. Is this man of God or not? And here, this story laid in the Torah when all this was happening. In Israel, they couldn't even see that their Messiah was to be smitten. And so the elders did it all over again. They smote him a second time. They smote him in reality, I should say, the first time. Now, we know later God says to Moses, speak to the rock, because it's only supposed to be smitten once. And he smites it in his anger. Now, in verse 8, it says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Do you know God was showing Israel what was going to happen after they smote Israel? The rock, Christ, Jesus. After they smote Yeshua HaMashiach, God was actually writing that Amalek, or in this case the Romans, were going to take and come and fight with Israel. Interesting, isn't it? And of course they did. According to Obadiah, God puts the blame on Esau as part of this battle and says that they were one with all of those Arabic nations that came against Israel. God charged them with this battle. The same thing that's going to happen today. All the Arabic nations right now are wanting to come against Israel, and they're being provoked by Rome. And because they're being provoked by Rome, God will hold Rome responsible for what happens in Israel. And so what happened here? And Moses said unto Joshua, choose, out, choose us out men and go and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Isn't it kind of interesting? You know, no, we don't know as far as that I know of. We know that there was a thief on his right and on his left when Yeshua was, was crucified. Sinners, in other words. It um, be interesting to know if her was also a part of the rebellion. We know Aaron was because later God says he, wanted, he wouldn't allow Aaron to go into the promised land because he, were, he had consented with the elders of Israel in speaking against Moses. But nonetheless, we find that Aaron and her go up and they have to hold up Moses' hands because as long as Moses' hands were up, then Israel prevailed. But when they were down, Israel lost. And that's what I find very interesting today. The very Jews 2,000 years ago, the forefathers, that were against Yeshua and allowed him to be crucified, there being a thief on the right and on the left, sinners in other words. And here Aaron and Hur, part of a rebellion against Moses, 
are now standing there having to hold up Moses' hands because his hands were heavy, the Bible says. And they had to hold his hands up. And as long as they held his hands up, he prevailed. And then what did Moses do? Moses sat down upon the rock. Another thing that was interesting in the story, though, is he climbs up on a hill. And in Israel, that's exactly what it is. On Golgotha, it's a hill. You come out Damascus Gate, they had to climb up on the hill. Or Christ is to be crucified. Christ was not smitten on the hill. Christ was smitten down at Caiaphas' house. He was smitten by the Roman authority inside what we would consider the old city today of Israel. And then he was taken out and gone up on top of the hill. And so Rome, the stage is being set again. You know, so what's funny. People know that history has to repeat itself. Do they forget that it was the Romans that came down? The Roman general Titus? He was the main man. He's the one that everybody writes about. This is the one Josephus writes about. The Roman general Titus. Now, I know they had a lot of, uh, they used a lot of the people from, from, the, uh, from the Syrian region and stuff like that. Of course, you forget Hadad, Hadad the Edomite, the royal seat of Esau that escaped out of the hand of King David's sword, flees, flees into Egypt, becomes raised in the Pharaoh's house, reared up, then leaves and goes to Syria and becomes the king of Syria bringing all of his pagan ideas and pagan gods with him. And of course, later we find him in Rome, according to God's word through his prophecy of Obadiah, where God clearly puts him as the guilty one with the Roman general Titus. So we have that. Um, now I want to share with you another thing. In Exodus 34, beginning in verse 7, it says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and the third and the fourth generation. Now, setting the stage, what happened in verse 1 to 6? This is when God, He commanded Moses to make two tables of stone because He broke the first ones which I think is kind of ironic. Moses has to go up to God a second time and come down a second time with the covenant. When he goes up the second time, Moses, right when he comes up into the presence of God, God told him when he come up, he would hide him in the cleft of the rock. You know, when God spoke about being hidden in the cleft of the rock, he was showing that he would take Moses out. It was foreshadowing that Moses would leave the scene for a period of time. And then he would declare as he come by to him his name. And he would allow him to see the back part of a man. He said, because you could not see my face and live. So we know that Moses has been in the presence of God now for the last 3,500 years. He appeared with Yeshua along with Eli excuse me, appeared with Elijah uh, on Mount Transfiguration showing clearly that it was the um, two olive branches on either side of the golden lampstand. Christ being the golden lampstand itself. Christ being the oil coming up, giving light into the seven branches. And there was an olive tree on either side. According to Zechariah, these are the two anointed ones that are upon the earth that, that go forth. Revelation 11 speaks about the two witnesses that would come in the last days that would bring judgment upon this earth that has rejected the Messiah. But in this particular case here, God has Moses up there and he comes back down. Or excuse me, before he comes down, he says, uh, God is saying, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity of the transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the, the, the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children and the third and the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Because Moses knew that Israel had sinned such a great sin. And he interceded on their behalf. And he asks God, and as he comes, after he worships the Lord, and he says, 
If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. He's crying out for their life, knowing that they're not worthy. It's the same thing today. Do you realize that? Israel, they re our forefathers rejected the Messiah. And for the last 2,000 years, yes, our eyes have been blinded, but still we have been a stiff-necked people. Not willing to hear. And we need someone to intercede on our behalf. Christ did it himself when he said, let, when, they, when we, we cried out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And no doubt it was meant in a derogatory sense. But Christ applied his blood upon the Jews in and our children. He even said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that blood atoned for Israel so that the Jews would not be wiped out over the next 2,000 years, even though Satan has tried to wipe them out. Do you know, it's even like with women. Do you know Satan has tried to wipe out women? There have been more women killed during the inquisition of the Catholic Church during the Dark Ages than anybody else. It was women that was the main target. Just like the Jews during the time of Hitler. He wanted to kill all the Jews that he possibly could, trying to wipe them out. It's amazing, isn't it? Satan hates Jews. He hates women. And the Vatican hates both. But anyhow... He cried out for their deliverance. And then God says something very interesting to him. And he says, Behold, I make a covenant. Before all thy people, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall, see, excuse me, which thou shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. Some people say, well, Israel coming back home as a nation. In fact, rabbis have tried to consider, is this the thing? Because rabbis, clearly, the rabbinical sages and the scholars as well of today in the rabbinical circles say, in fact, they actually changed it. They actually admit in the Torah, in the, in the translation of the English, they changed the word because God clearly said right here to them before that I will, I will do more. Actually, in Hebrew, it says wonders such as has not been done in all the earth. And they changed it to another word because they, they couldn't understand. They said never did Moses ever do anything greater than the parting of the Red Sea and the plagues of Egypt. But God says with Moses, he will do it. And he says, and for it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. In King James, it says, I will do with thee. The wonders are not going to be good. They're going to be bad. And it'll be greater than everything that happened in Egypt. Because remember, all the great wonders that Moses had done in Egypt was destruction and death. And he's going to repeat it again, but it will be much greater. And he says to Moses, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. And tell me he isn't coming back. He didn't say, I'm going to do it with Enoch. Now see, so Jesus himself has already said that Elijah shall come and shall restore all things in the future. John the Baptist is dead. He puts it in the future. He says, now I say, they've already done to him what they listed. Now he's talking about John. But you've got to remember, Malachi 4, Jesus only attributes half of the verse to John. The other half, he doesn't attribute to John. So, did John not fulfill the other half? No, he did not. He turned the hearts of the fathers to the children, but he didn't turn the hearts of the children to their fathers. I'm not talking about like Tony Palmer, who has this absurd idea 
that he comes in the spirit of Elijah to turn them all back to the Catholic Church. Well, that's what the world wants you to believe, and that's exactly what the Catholic Church wants you to believe too. Make up their little Mahadi for you to go follow some nonsense Arabic stupidity ideology thinking that's a the Antichrist. Everything is laying all in front of you. Take, go to our YouTube channel. Find the things on the Antichrist. We have, we, I titled a thing there for you. I even did one for the two witnesses. Listen to those videos, my friends. I'm saying these things because I'm trying to warn you. In fact, let me tell you this before I go a little deeper. People have asked me before. I've had letters written to me. Brother Steve, where do you think is a safe place to be? A lot of people ask me, should we go to Israel? No, I don't, I don't recommend you going to Israel at all. Israel's not going to be a safe place. In fact, when the two witnesses are on the scene, yes, they will be in Israel, and yes, they will be bringing judgments over the entire world. They're going to do a lot more than that. God will judge this world because of their testimony. In fact, Jesus, again, even in, 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 in Luke, excuse me, Matthew 24, speaks about the two witnesses. Again, we'll go into that in just a minute. But anyway, so where is a safe place? One, get in Christ. That is the safest place I know of. And if you're in Him, He will direct you. Now, we know that when Jesus said in Matthew 24, He says, when you see these things coming about, flee to the mountains. And He says, Judea and Samaria. Flee, those of you that are in Judea and Samaria, flee to the mountains. They actually did that when Titus and them came in. That's how some of the Jews survived. But we know it has a compound fulfillment. So what would be my thought for you? Wherever you live, when you see the stuff hit the fan the way it's going to hit the fan, flee to the mountains, wherever you live. Something you know and understand. But be in Christ. My wife had a, an incredible dream not long ago. In fact, some sister wrote her recently, had no idea that my wife dreamed this. And my wife was telling me that the sister had almost an identical dream. But my wife and the dream that she had, we were, we were in some building and they, and they were coming to kill the entire family. And my wife said, you could hear them. She said, they had some kind of equipment they could tell where you were hiding. And she said, they didn't have to try to figure out where you were hiding. They knew where you were hiding. And she said, they were just killing people left and right. And she said she was so fearful, and she said in her heart, God, if I'm going to die, I'd rather not hide. I'd rather just let them come and kill me the way I am. No sense in hiding. And she said suddenly, like a flash of light, she said an angel stood there with her, uh, stood right behind her. She said he had six wings, and she said he took his wings and he wrapped them around her. She said he was much taller than her. And she said and it was like she was in a white cylinder of light. And she said, he didn't say much. All he said is they won't be able to see you now. And told her not to fear. She said, when it was all over, she said, I can still hear them killing people. She said, but when it was over and they were gone, the angel was out as fast as he came in. So when you're hid in Christ, he will provide what you have need of. But there's going to be a lot of people that will die as well. Now, but at the same time, Rome is going to be getting a run for their money. Because God is going to bring that judgment, what he says here to Moses. Well, notice what God says. He says, and he said, behold, I make a covenant. He's, the children of Israel are not there with, with Moses when God is speaking to Moses. He says, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels. Covenant was between God and Moses. He says, Before all thy people I will do marvels, such as, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among them, excuse me, among which thou art, shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Now do we think about a Revelation 11 where um, it says in Revelation 11 about the two witnesses when they come, they turn the waters to blood. They, turn the, uh, uh, they bring down fire. Uh, or excuse me, they, they close the heavens that it rain not in the days of their ministry. They can bring about any plague as often as they will. Now that's, a, that's Revelation 11 with the two witnesses. 
Both those miracles are miracles that Elijah did and Moses did. Moses did the water of the blood. Elijah brought the clothes of the heavens that it didn't rain in the days of his ministry. It's repeated again. And he says, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. It's not that fire, literally fire, comes rolling out of their mouth, but if you think about the way Elijah did that, what did Elijah do? The 50 soldiers come up and he said, If I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. And it did. Let the Vatican send their little Arabic thugs into Israel. I guarantee you one thing. When Moses and Elijah are there, they'll deal with your thugs. The remnant of Israel, God will have his hand on. Remember what Jeremiah was told. Go to the city, that all those that cry inside day and night for the abominations, and put a seal upon them, and the rest kill. God is coming for a remnant that would believe that Yeshua indeed was Mashiach. That's who he's coming for. Not everybody in Israel is going to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, but there is a remnant there that will. And God knows who they are. So, we see that there. And then let me share with you two more scriptures and we'll close. Yes. Let me read to you. I won't go into the whole chapter by no means, but God clearly, He is showing you that Edom is Esau. And as I said to you before, remember, Rome has to reestablish their chokehold on Israel. Because God is basically setting everything back up like it was 2,000 years ago. Rome, once again, will have control over Israel. Now, Israel still has self-autonomy from what it appears to be. But when I say Rome is going to have control, it's just going to be, it's going to be like it was 2,000 years ago. The politicians, whoever is the prime minister, is going to answer to Rome. If he's not already doing it, must be doing something like that. Look what happened at the tomb of David. They don't even do a referendum. They don't even give the people the right to vote whether or not the Vatican can do uh, communion service, not only in the what is considered to be the Last Supper room, which may be the very grounds that that was done on, but they even go in the tomb of David and do a, do a communion service completely against the Jewish. But they did it intentionally to show that they have authority on Mount Zion. And why did Israel give the Pope a seat when Pope Benedict was, was Pope and then Pope Francis comes and sits on that seat and takes his place as King of Israel? And you wonder why the scripture says that wicked prince of Israel. It's not that it's a Jew. It's because they crowned the Pope as the King of Israel. But don't worry, God's going to deal with him. So what does he say here? For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, hello, King David's tomb, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion, shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. God's sending deliverance on Mount Zion. He's got to liberate Mount Zion from the Vatican. Don't forget Mount Zion also is where Yeshua was judged at, humiliated by the high priest, mocked, made fun of. Remember the rock Remember, God had the children of Israel go with Moses out there to smite the rock. And what, what, did, what, did, what did they do to, to Jesus when he was there in, that, in, that, in Caiaphas' house? They slapped him around. He said, tell us who prophesied, tell us, prophesy to us, if thou be the Son of God. Tell us who hit you. Mm. So many things could be said there. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. 
And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain of the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess the Canaanites, even into Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Zarephath. Uh, Sepharad shall possess the cities of the south and saviors. Um, King James puts deliverers, but you know, saviors is actually more right, not savior like as in the Messiah is a savior, but in Hebrew, it's the plural for anointed ones. Moshichanim, anointed ones. In fact, Zechariah. We translate that anointed ones, but that's not actually the word anointed ones in Zechariah. Although it, it is a correct translation to bring out the, the point, but it's actually here in Obadiah that it uses the word anointed ones. And anointed ones shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So God is going to take Moses and Elijah, and he's already made a covenant with Moses and told him he's going to do it. So how do we deal with this then? Why, why do we want to have... So many argue, well, Enoch didn't die, and, and, and Elijah didn't die, but Moses died. It's pointed to once a man to die. If that's the case, then there's no rapture then either, is there? And, and that doesn't matter if you believe the rapture pre-trip, mid-trip, or post-trip. If you believe any kind of rapture whatsoever, which you, you have to believe in something like that, because Paul clearly said, we which are alive and remain shall not hinder or prevent them that are asleep. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive shall meet them in the air and be with the Lord. We shall be changed in the moment and twinkling of an eye. So it doesn't matter when you believe it is, nonetheless, you still believe that there's a change. There's going to be some that won't taste death. So why then do you think that Enoch has to come back and die? Makes no sense. Totally doesn't make sense. At any rate, I, I said I want to take you to, to Matthew 24. Let me conclude with this right here. In Matthew 24. They asked Jesus the question about the signs of his coming. He says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. That is the papal dynasty. I've shared that with you before. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. All kinds of wars and rumors of wars have happened, even if you want to go back down to, into history and look at the wars and stuff. But we've also had World War I, World War II. We've had a rumor of a war of Russia and the United States going at it. We've also had wars in Israel, the, the War of Independence, the War of Six Days War in 1967. We have the war in 1972. And there's been plenty of rumors of wars, of, of more wars that are going to come to pass in the near future for Israel. So we've seen the wars and rumors of wars. Then shall they deliver you up to be a... Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, then it says, verse 7, For a nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All of this we're seeing. Nations are rising against nations, kingdom against kingdom, and it's going to even increase even more so. Okay, all these are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrow. This is where we're at. We're about to go into the time of sorrow. Make ready with prayer like never before. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Those true Christians, you're going to be hated for the true name of Yeshua. I'm not talking about you have to say Yeshua, you have to say Jesus. No, that's not, that's not the point. Please don't mix that up. Whatever language you're born in, you know, what are we going to do? Say all the Spanish people don't make it because all they know is Jesus? It's nonsense. The thing is, is you know him as Jesus or Jesus or Yeshua or, or, or Jesus or whatever the case may be. But you know him because you have a relationship with him, not because you know how to pronounce the name.
but they're going to deliver you up for his sake. That's Jew and Gentile alike. True Christians, that is. And you know who's going to deliver you up? Rome. You know who's going to deliver you up? Your pastors. We're going to go, I'll go into that with my wife with you guys on that. It's very interesting to see all this. They've joined already a, a, a covenant with Rome. They, they're in a covenant with Rome. What you saw with Kenneth Copeland, this was something that was done years before Kenneth Copeland. They finally decided, okay, it's time to bring this out. Your pastors, all these 501c churches have already joined into this nonsense. And yet there's so many true Christians in these churches that love the Lord. No wonder why he says to them, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her plague. He says the same to Israel, come out of her. You know, people like, people like uh, Netanyahu still has a chance. He's a Jew. He doesn't even really realize who Christ really is. He has an opportunity to come out of her, my people. Revelation 18.4, I believe that is. I'm just quoting off the top of my head. It could be 19.4. I know it's in the fourth verse, but I think it's 18.4. Verse 10. And then shall, excuse me, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. That's exactly what's happening now. Oh, you're saying something against the Baptist church? You're saying something against the Methodist church? You know, we're Protestants. No, you're not. The Baptist church is one of the main churches. And I say this for my dear, precious Christians that are Baptists. Your church is one of the main ones that joined into the Vatican. No wonder why they have the H.H. House in America and many other houses like it where they torture little girls from as young as nine years old. We're going to bring that out soon to you as well. So they're going to, you're going to, many are going to be offended. They're going to hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. It's already happening. It's been happening. And it's going to happen even more. All claiming, I, I get them all the time. I can't tell you how many two witnesses have contacted me over the years. And because iniquity shall abound and the love of many shall, shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, Notice, this is what's interesting. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. As I said to you recently on another video, that is your two witnesses bringing this gospel. Or as, it, as Peter, excuse me, as Matthew wrote in the Hebrew form, this evangeli. He had to use the transliterated word in Hebrew so that, so that they would know because they were speaking Greek, many of those in that day, but he wrote it in the Hebrew language like Paul beckoned to them in the Hebrew language and they listened all the more earnestly. So the Jews have kept that Hebrew gospel that they had of Matthew because they wanted to be able to, to, to argue with the Christians. They wanted to know what Matthew really said. So when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, why does God need a witness? Because God will not stone a prostitute, a woman that is untrue to her marriage vow, unless he has at least two witnesses. And the Bible says in Revelation that the whore had daughters and they were harlots. You have a name, but it's not Christ's name. Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Charismatic, whatever you want to call yourself, you're either a Christian or you're not. And you're a Christian because you have an individual walk with Christ. Not because you belong to a church. You're not saved because you belong to the church. You're saved because you've given your life to Christ and you belong to Him. And so, even when, when, when Matthew was trying to bring this out, this evangelia, in other words, the gospel that you're hearing right now, the way it's being preached right now, this is what's going to have to be preached again, and it'll be preached into all nations. Because they're going to make sure you're going to hear then the two witnesses, they'll be on the news broadcast everywhere. And then when they stone them in the streets, according to Revelation 11, they'll be stoned to death. They'll be killed there. And when they're dead bodies that have been laid in the street three and a half days, they don't suffer them graves. Why? They've been preaching the resurrection. You know what? As a mockery 
when they killed him, the reason they don't put him in graves is because they're preaching the resurrection of Yeshua so strongly that he raised up on the third day. They're going to do the same way that Jesus did. They're going to say that you're going to kill me, and you'll see we will raise up. Jesus did the same thing. That's the same gospel. He told his disciples, I will be delivered into the hands of the wicked one, and this is what they're going to do. They're going to take, take and kill me. They're going to smite the shepherd. The sheep will be scattered. But he prophesies of his own death how you'll die in everything. So are the two witnesses. So it's a mockery to prove because they want to show that the Pope is the Viker. But when their dead bodies raise up, that's when you need to be hidden Christ in because then His judgment falls. Hmm. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. God bless you. Good night. Uh, I know it's all chopped up, but I hope that it's a blessing to you somehow. We love you. Remember us. We thank you for your support, but do remember us. We have a lot of expense to be dealing with here in the very near future. Uh, we're coming to the United States. We'll be there for about a month. Um, and just a lot of expenses. And we, we, we know that God knows everything, and we thank God for you and for all that you do for us as well. Shalom and good night.